Hello, this is Jurgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. Today's vlog is titled, What John Grinder Taught Me. I'm a lucky bastard. For, uh, I would say, about five, six, seven years, I had the chance to correspond regularly, have a friendship with, get input from, what very well could be the, the smartest and wisest human being that I've, I've ever met. And uh, I would like to share some of the learnings, uh, some of the stuff that I've gotten from all this interaction uh, with John with you guys. So this is kind of a tribute to John Grinder, also to show my, my gratitude for, for my old uh, mentor and, and friend. If you've had the chance to meet John, you, you know that he's a very remarkable, very unique human being. He is one of a kind. You, you won't find many John Grinder types walking around. So if, uh, if you consider a guy whose background is as varied as, you know, from having co-created the field of neuro-linguistic programming with uh, Richard Bandler and Frank Pusilic in, in the early 70s. And, you know, the modeling work of having spent time with Milton Erickson and Virginia Satir and Frank Ferrelli and all these various models of excellence. If you add that to a guy who uh, spent quite a bit of time working, um, doing intelligence work undercover uh, as part of the, the U.S. Army in, 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 uh, in Europe in the 60s, um, a guy who speaks 10 languages, 10, count them, 10 languages. He used to teach advanced mathematics, uh, who flies planes and rides horses and is still doing ice and rock climbing into his uh, late, um, late 70s, um, who at one time was known as, as one of the premier linguists in the United States and, and uh, according to him was kind of um, next in line to perhaps take uh, Noam Chomsky's work to, to the next level. He's been able to spend time with you know, people like Chomsky and the, the, the anthropologist Gregory Bateson. If you take a guy with that diverse a background um, and you get a chance to, to pick his brains and, and to spend a little bit of time with, it, with him, um, that's likely going to have a deep impact on you as, as it did with me. So I, I first met John back in 2003 in London and um, had a great time there interacting with him. Um, but I really connected with him in 2005 in Oslo when he did a seminar. And I remember clearly he was up on stage talking about how all beliefs are limiting and how identity is a deep trap and how all self-concepts are complete BS, just these arbitrary linguistic constructs. And of course, I would challenge him and say, well, do you really believe that? And then we were off to the races. Now, the, the first thing that, that really struck me and, and impacted me with John was, was not really so much what he was teaching, but it was more John Grinder being John Grinder. The, the way he carried himself and, and the way he actually operated. There's a lot of teachers um, in this world who uh, pay lip service to the idea that they want feedback, that they welcome challenges, that they really like questions. Um, partially many do, but uh, my experience as a guy who's often liked uh, challenging ideas that other people hold sacred, um, I've often found this to not quite be the case. So John Grinder was perhaps the first real exception where I noticed that when I actually challenged his ideas, he liked it. He actually liked it. He got curious. He got playful. He got switched on. He actually encouraged it. And uh, that was a new experience for me. The, the experience of a teacher who could deal with my questions and who could do so while remaining in a playful, curious state of being willing to explore. You know, that, that really struck me as, as something. 
Not only that, but he really taught me to appreciate not knowing, to appreciate uncertainty, doubt, confusion. If you look at quite a few NLP teachers and hypnotherapy teachers and, and others, you know, they really emphasize certainty and knowing and, you know, being in control and having the answers and that type of stuff. Um, John helped me really appreciate the, the flip sides of the coin, the, the value of being able to operate and listen from a know-nothing state, for example. Uh, the, the, the value of doubt, how old beliefs in fact are limiting, how identities are a deep trap, how language is both a blessing and a curse. And he very elegantly made the points that, look, as, as, long, as soon as you believe something, you'll have a tendency to look for what fits, what confirms what you believe, and you'll have a tendency to ignore the differences. The challenge being, that there's the differences that's what you actually learn from that's where you have the capacity to to actually learn something and that we unconsciously have a tendency to organize our lives in a way that support and reinforce our beliefs and if our beliefs are strong enough we we set up unconsciously so strong filters that we we rob ourselves of the opportunity to even have experiences and see perspectives that could correct or alter or modify the existing belief. How identity, you know, thinking that we are a particular way in many ways is a deep trance, a deep trap and, and can be anxiety provoking. How all self-concepts really are linguistic constructions. So, uh, so, from the point of learning, like like uh, as a couple of practical applications, John would inspire me to have a habit uh, when doing change work that, look, if, if you have something up your sleeve that you know is very likely going to work, at least some of the time save it for last. Do other stuff first so that you have the opportunity to actually shake your own filters. He would challenge me with the following. He would say, look, take a particular pattern and then think of where it would be the least likely to work or apply and then with full congruence go do that to really test the, the, the limit of the patterns and to kind of test your own assumptions. So I discovered, for example, on a few cases that I could help people with insomnia by applying a high performance state induced through an alphabet game, which to me made no sense whatsoever. Uh, this is, of course, new code NLP jargon for those guys, for those of you who aren't into it. But it's something I likely would have never done hadn't it been for... Uh, John's teachings, you know, really helping me to see that, that that certainty and feelings of understanding are feeling states. They essentially tell you that you've been able to take the few pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that you have in your mind. John doesn't use words like mind, but and fit them together in a way that that gives a internal coherence. And then we kind of confuse that with, with actual competence in the world. So being skeptical of feelings of certainty and feelings of getting it and feelings of understanding and using those internal states as signals that it's, it's time to open up the field again. It's, it's time to, to, to begin to ask, what am I missing? What, what else is here? As John very often used to say, the, the, the question is not what is real, it is in how many ways can we appreciate that which surrounds us. So um, another thing that, that really uh, made a difference for me with, with John was his willingness to actually do stuff, his willingness to actually test stuff. Um, I used to run an impossibles practice for many, many years, and this was partly inspired by 
John and Richard and, and Milton Erickson, where I would look for people who hadn't succeeded in traditional therapies and offer to work with them based upon a no change, no pay fee. I did this for about eight years. So John, being the co-creator of NLP, you know, being a uh, top dog in that particular field, would, would contact me and say, hey, Jurgen, when I come to Oslo, do you have any impossibles lined up for me? You know, I'll show you how it's done. I'll kick your ass. And and uh, if memory serves me correctly, he ended up... I, I lined up a couple of people for him, but he, he ended up just working with one. But uh, reportedly, he came down the steps of the Grand Hotel in Oslo with uh, his extremely ugly tracksuit and met this client of mine who, who was a client with a, uh, a skin disorder. And uh, he didn't have success with her either. But the fact that he was willing to look foolish, the fact that he was willing to give it a shot, the, the willing that he was willing to put his reputation on the line in service of learning. How cool isn't that? I, I don't know many people in that particular world who, who would have done that, especially not you know, at the level of co-founders or, or, or kind of superstars in, in the field. But, but, but that whole uh, mindset of being willing to go up on stage, for example, in his ugly tracksuits and being comfortable in his own skin and not having to fake anything, these, these are qualities that, that I do my best to embody as well. And, and uh, it's so gratifying when, when you can have a teacher who, who, who actually lives that. The willingness to work outside of a so-called scope of practice. You know, in, in most professions, you have the, the idea that you're supposed to work within a scope of practice. John would often emphasize, you know, the value of working outside of a scope of practice, um, of being willing to, to uh, do the impossible to shake up assumptions, to, to pioneer stuff, to, to go places where other people don't go. So one time when he came to Oslo to do a seminar, he, he, he contacted me and said, you know, what are you doing on Friday? Do you want to join me uh, for a tag team match? So John and I did our best to help a woman with late stage cancer develop a not so spontaneous remission. We never got there. We might have, but we didn't. We, we only got the chance to, to see her once. But um, during that session, we, we had fun. We, we really didn't have a plan. We, we ended up doing double inductions where I would speak in Norwegian at times because this was a Norwegian client and John would speak in English. And even though Norwegian is not one of the 10 languages he speaks, um, we were such in flow. It seemed as if he was able to on some level get what I was saying and at one point he kind of reached a stuck point with the client and I was able to to jump in and, and find a solution to that and we, we, we just have this this cool flow state experience you know me and John and the clients now once again we, we weren't successful in um, in terms of outcome but the, the willingness to do it, the, the willingness to, to take on the, in quotation marks, impossible cases to explore what might be possible and to kind of put your reputation on the line when doing so, that's great. Though the people who do that are the people who actually pioneer stuff because everything around you that, that you appreciate is the result of someone being willing to think outside of the scope of practice. So uh, he even took on my mother once as, as a client, as a very, very uh, difficult client to work with. Uh, I actually took my mother to, uh, to Santa Cruz in, uh, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, she had a tumor at the time, and uh, he was willing to take on that challenge as well, along with other people. And again, another case of failure. But so you might add, you might you know wonder why am I bringing up these failure cases you know with a guy who's obviously had plenty of successes. 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you why. Why in quotation marks? Um, because when people have asked me throughout the years, you know, what is it about John that kind of impacted you the most? I, I would say seeing him fail and seeing him remain in a playful, curious state committed to learning. Of course, I knew that he, of course, had plenty of failures, had to have, but it's it's something to see it and observe it and see the person being able to to deal with it in in a very resourceful way. I remember once being in his his hotel suite and and his wife came in and kind of alarmed because he had double booked. Uh, it was a phone from Paris. Uh, it was supposed to there were like 130 people waiting for him in Paris, and he was juggling and he he, he didn't lose his state for a second. It's just practically just dealing with it and we kind of discovered that the best reframe for the situation was thank god it wasn't a time management seminar um but 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 anyways so um after that second seminar in 2005 uh, in oslo um i ended up asking john a few questions that apparently people hadn't asked and that, that he was waiting for someone to ask and I was so impressed by how he dealt with the questions that we, we had an instantaneous connection a very good bond the the seminar kind of evolved into this collaboration between me and him which I think everybody else also uh, enjoyed and the following Monday he actually contacted me on email and said you know I'm here ask more questions and and, and um, I think he sensed that I was willing to play with stuff and willing to actually do stuff. So for the next five or six years, we would correspond often many times a week. Of course, me asking him questions about everything and he proposing experiments and and, and also at times, even him opening for the opportunity that I might know something that he doesn't, that, that there's something about my perspective that may enrich in his that sometimes he would do experiments based upon stuff that that i kind of suggested so uh, for a uh, a teacher to be willing to find a student within uh, while collaborating with a student who also finds the teacher within um, something really really awesome about that of course the 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 skills that John taught me to uh, you know whenever I've gone to coaching courses or psychology courses or, or other modalities of, of psychotherapy I've always been stunned by the amount of projections and wild wild mind reads that people engage in and I've always come back came back to to the simple meta model and and the abbreviated version of it, the verbal package that, that John teaches as so extremely useful, so extremely useful in terms of evoking specific and relevant information and to help people to, to connect their language to concrete experience. And for us as agents of change to avoid projecting so much and hallucinating so much. Uh, he also shared my view that that attempting to understand clients and attempting to do empathy was 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 a big mistake. It's it's an opinion and an observation that I've that I I've had my entire career, and John was the first guy to agree with me to to uh, to hold similar views. So uh, and and even though my style of working today is very different from how John works. And even though my ways of doing stuff are, are, are quite different, I think that's also a tribute to John as a teacher in that having been very influenced by him and, and having had the chance to, to, to pick his brains and correspond with him, I'm very far from a John Grinder clone. Um, and that, that that's also a, a compliment to the teacher so there's a lot of stuff I disagree with John about you know we, we have different styles and and some different assumptions and 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 that's fine but I will always be extremely grateful for 
the the generosity, the profound knowledge, the the, the wisdom, uh, the congruence, the willingness to uh, to do stuff, to explore. Um, it's enriched my life both as a person and also as a professional in in deep ways. So John is getting up there in age. He's 78, I think, at this particular time. So if you're curious about NLP, hypnosis, psychology, philosophy, if you're curious about how you tick and how human beings tick, I, I, you know, I really think you owe yourself the opportunity, if you can, to spend some time with John to to test him out. He he really is, he really is one of a kind. And uh, from my perspective, few people have impacted me more, and uh, I will be forever grateful. So um, hope these ramblings down memory lane, from from my perspective, have have been somewhat amusing and, and useful to you. And uh, till next time, have a great one.